LTAP Center, and uh, which is located at the Ohio Department of Transportation in the Division of Planning, the Office of Local Programs. And today we are making a video on how to properly conduct a curve study. And uh, the main part that we're going to focus on in the curve study is how to properly determine the advisory speed for a curve. And uh, this has all come about because we've been getting a lot of questions from our township trustees and county engineers who are participating in our township sign upgrade program. And um, they need to know what is the advisory speed of a curve so they can order the signs for that curve. And uh, when I'm talking about the signs for a curve, here's a picture from our OMU TCD and uh, the Ohio Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And it shows a specific sign here, the um, advisory speed plaque, which is sign W13-1P. And uh, it's a very important sign, so it lets the drivers know what they should bring their speed down to as they traverse through the curve. And uh, today I have Jennifer Jenkins here with me. She's our District 6 uh, transportation engineer who specializes in these curve studies. She's done a lot of curve studies throughout her career, and uh, we selected her as our expert for the day, and uh, which she has earned very well. And um, so she's going to talk about um, the curve study in general. Yeah. And, uh, so today we're going to go out and do a curve study. Um, and to determine the advisory speed because the placement of all our other signs are dependent on what our advisory speed is. Um, so there's a couple different ways to do that, but today we're going to use the digital ball bank indicator and we will show you how to mount this in the car, um, how to drive through the curve. It's important to maintain a steady speed and to get the readings from this to determine what the advisory speed should be and how to place the advance warning signs, the chevrons, the larger arrows based on that advisory speed. Um, a couple important forms that we use is section 1200 of the TEM. Um, there's directions on there about ball bank indicators and um, it kind of outlines what we're going to go over today. And then another important go-to place is part two of the OMU TCD, that's the Ohio Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Um, it, it has tables in there to help you decide which signs to use and where to place them. Um, so we're doing this to address roadway departure crashes. Um, every 30 minutes there is a roadway fatality from a roadway departure crash in the U.S. So our goal with this program is to address roadway de departure crashes and to keep cars on the road. And we're going to do that by illuminating our curves and drawing attention so that the cars will you know, slow down. That's right, because uh, when you install these signs, it's been determined and studied that uh, just, just by adding these curve signs to your curves, we can expect to reduce crashes by up to 25% for that curve. That's just right. by simply installing signs. So we're going to a bank for our buck. It's a low-cost countermeasure. Right. And ODA is rolling out these systematic safety programs. Um, upgrading our curve signs is one of them. Upgrading intersection signs, um, the rumble stripes, for example. So we're trying to address a lot of locations with low-cost countermeasures instead of just a couple individual spot locations where we're spending a lot of money. That's right, and uh, we've selected a curve down in Fayette County, Ohio on State Route 41, just north of Washington Courthouse. And so the next time you see us, we're going to be out in the field down on State Route 41. All right? Okay. So we'll see you out in the field. Our digital ball bank indicator. So we have a piece of Velcro on the bottom and we're just going to put it on the dashboard with another piece of Velcro. Um, it comes with this cord 
and it's so you can attach it to a computer, but we're not going to use the computer today, um, but it's also the power cord. So, you just plug the big end into the little end. And then this just plugs into your cigarette lighter. So we should have power now. So you want to make sure it's securely fast fastened to your dashboard. And then you need to level the meter initially. So this REL button is to re-level it. So when we push it, it should re-level to zero. Um, and it bobbles around just because of the vibrations of the car. And once you have it leveled, you don't want to turn it off. You want to make sure you leave it on. And before you level it, you want to make sure everyone that's going to be in the car is in their seats. And once you level it, you don't want to switch seats. You want to keep everything nice and even. Um, and you want to level it when your car is on a flat surface. So. We are sitting on a concrete pad right now to level this. That's all there is to it. <laughs> Alright, we're approaching our first curve study location and I wanted to go over the curves that or the forms that I normally print off before I do the study. Um, this first form is a map of the location and I leave a blank spot to take notes of existing conditions. And since this location was identified because of the number of crashes that we've had, I reviewed the crash reports before we came out, and this is a summary of the types of crashes that we've had. Um, right here, this is the curve that we're going to study. This is where the majority of the crashes were occurring. Um, and I just got on Google Maps and used the measuring tool and measured the length of the curve. So I measured the curve length at 450 feet. Um, you can use Google Maps, the measuring tool in there to do that, or if you have a distance meter in your car, you can use that, or you can get a wheel and use that to measure the length of the curve. Um, I also measured the distance to the next curve, which this is 895 feet, because 600 is the magic number, so if there's less than 600 feet between curves, you treat it as one location, but if there's more than 600 feet, then you treat it as multiple locations and you sign them separately. But if there's less than 600 feet, then it would be treated as one location and you would sign it together with a reverse curve sign. Um, the second form is the curve study sheet. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna drive through this curve several times and we're gonna maintain a steady speed. Um, and we'll want to go that speed several different times. So here's enough for three trials, and then we can take the average of that to determine our advisory speed. And then this third form is our curve sign order form. So this has all the different signs that we could apply to this curve and has places for quantities. And then, um, in this spot down here, I normally make notes of what the actual recommendations are. And those are the three forms that I print off before we come. All right, as we're approaching our first curve, um, I'll push this min-max button to start the meter. So I wanna do that when we're on the straight section approaching the curve. And you wanna maintain a steady speed we're starting out by driving 35 miles per hour. So we want to maintain a steady speed and not have any jerky um, hand movements through the curve. We just want to go at a nice steady speed. Okay, um, about at a 35 exactly. All right, try to stay in the center of the lane and avoid any bumps along the way. And once we're on the straight section again, I'll press this min-max button to get our reading. Okay. 
Now you'll notice that, that curve already has some curve warning signs on it. Um, this location was identified by FHWA and it was based on the number of crashes, so not whether or not the signs were existing. But we're field reviewing all of these locations um, and a lot of the standards have changed in the past couple revisions of the OMUTCD, so we want to make sure it's up to current standards. So now, once we pull over, I'll write our readings down in our curve study sheet. So this meter, um, it'll give you a negative number and a positive number, and that's whether it's a left curve or a right curve, so it measures the minimum and maximum readings left and right. So we want to take the highest number, um, the absolute value, so if it's negative 12.83, we'll take 12.83, but we want to get the, that's either, the, that's the minimum, so we want to get the maximum too and it's 2.16. So we want to take the 12.83 reading. So we were driving 35 miles per hour and that was our first trial. So right here we'll write 12.83. All right, and now we'll drive through it the other way and do the same thing. through this first curve for first and not push the button yet because we want the measurements for the second curve. So now that we're on the straight section approaching the curve I push the min max button so that starts our meter reading. Now if there was less than 600 feet between these two curves we would have started before that first curve because we would sign it as one location. Okay 35 miles per hour on the button. So again, we're maintaining a steady speed through the curve. And then once we get back on the tangent section, I push this min-max button to get our reading. Okay. I'll write a number that time. So that, that run we were running southbound, so here I noted northbound and southbound, so each direction you put it in separate boxes. But we were going 35 miles per hour, and we got 14.29 and 3.59. So we're going to take the 14.29 reading and put it in this first column. Um, for 35 miles per hour, to be considered a safe speed, our reading should be below 12 degrees. So we'll run through this again and we'll knock it down 5 miles per hour. So we'll go through this curve at 30 miles per hour. Man found the culprit. Slow down. 